Welcome to this video series about measuring value creation in private equity, where we look at how things like Calculus 101 can help us understand private equity returns. My name is Mike Reinert. I've worked in the industry for 15 years. I run a website called Exilia Mathematica, and I wrote a book titled Private Equity Value Creation Analysis. These videos cover findings from my work website and book, and they're designed for private equity practitioners who use data to raise capital or evaluate the returns of private equity deals, funds, GPs, and investment programs. If it's helpful to you, subscribe and check out the website where you can download all the Excel files behind every episode. This is video number four in the value creation series, and it's the one where we start to build the models demonstrated in the book and on the website. The first three videos hopefully showed that the value creation models are interesting and useful, and we understand how many GPs, LPs, and academics use them. We will now describe a better way to do the math. Let us start with a basic setup that applies both to the derivative model of value creation in this video and the logarithmic model of value creation in the next one. Many of the models out there start by measuring company level EBITDA growth or multiple expansion or leverage, and then they work backwards to make the model fit the GP's returns in the deal. What we're going to do is make the GP's return or the fund's return the fundamental unit of value creation from which all of the other value creation components are derived. So we'll start with the GP or fund level equity value, FEC V, and see how that changes over time. Absolute value creation V is simply the change in FEC V. And from that, you can get other value creation measurements like the gross multiple of invested capital times money or the gross IRR. Now, because FEC V changes over time, it's a function of time, and we indicate that with this sub T term. The first thing that we need to do is incorporate the GP's ownership percentage into the model. Let us define phi at time t as the fund's equity value divided by the total shareholder equity value. This allows us to write fund equity value as the product of tech v and phi. Then we can incorporate the leverage value driver into the model. Let us define the equity ratio er at time t as total equity value divided by total enterprise value. This allows us to write fund equity value as the product of tev, er, and phi. Then we can incorporate performance and valuation into the model. Let us define the enterprise valuation multiple at time t as TEV divided by the company's TTM EBITDA. This allows us to write fund equity value as the product of E, M, E, R, and phi. And then we can incorporate other P&L values into the model. Let us define the company's EBITDA margin at time t as its EBITDA divided by its revenue. This allows us to write fund equity value as the product of R, E, M, M, E, R, and phi. Now we could take this further as shown here, but the point is that we define all the value creation variables in a way that maintains a mathematically rigorous relationship to fund equity value, which is the number that you'll find in the GP's quarterly report. And this allows us to create a hierarchical decomposition of equity value creation, like this one here. There are no plugs, everything can be split up and added back together again. So you could be as detailed as you wish and define things in whatever way makes the most sense to the GP's investment strategy or the LP's investment program. You can define operational drivers from the market share or EBITDA margin, financing drivers from dilution or gearing, or market drivers from growth in the addressable market or prevailing market multiples. So to build this, let's go back to the fact that fund equity value is a function of time. The instantaneous change in fund equity value can be described by a time derivative like this one here. And then we could start with a four-term expression that has EBITDA, valuation multiple, equity ratio, and phi. Now, all of these are also functions of time. So in order to differentiate them, we need to go back to Calc 101 and remember something called the product rule. That says that the instantaneous change in FEC V must be equal to the instantaneous change in EBITDA times M, E, R, and phi, plus the instantaneous change in multiple times E, E, R, and phi, plus the instantaneous change in the equity ratio times E, M, and phi, plus the instantaneous change in phi times E, M, and E, R. Now, we can simplify this equation a bit because at any time T, the product of E and M is T, E, V, and the product of E, M, and E, R is tech V. And this gives us the following, which is a completely accurate description of how changes in EBITDA, multiple, equity ratio, and phi influence the equity return. Now, there's a mathematical assumption behind this that all the variables are continuous and well-behaved functions, and while they generally are well-behaved, they're not technically continuous because we don't know what these values are at every moment. For example, we might not know the EBITDA until the CFO closes the books or the GP publishes its quarterly report. So to drive these formulas with data that is practical and accessible, we should replace the instantaneous changes with discrete changes. 
we swap out the derivative terms with delta x over delta t and replace the x sub t terms with the average value between t1 and t2. This gives us the following expression. And then we see that these delta t terms and the denominators cancel, and we get the derivative model expression for fund level value creation with EBITDA growth, multiple expansion, leverage effect, and fund ownership impact. Now, it's no accident that starting with four value creation variables gave us four value drivers. We would have derived five value drivers if we started with the expression that had revenue and EBITDA margin instead of EBITDA. In this case, the EBITDA growth term would have been replaced with two others, a revenue growth term that had delta R and average EM instead of delta E, and an EBITDA margin expression that had delta EM and average R instead of delta E. So you see that the value creation formulas tend to be symmetrical like that. Just like EBITDA growth is delta E times M and multiple expansion is delta M times E. These two combine to produce the unlevered return, which has the change in enterprise valuation times the average equity ratio. And this is the mirror image of the leverage effect, which is the change in the equity ratio times the average enterprise valuation. Now note that here in the derivative model, the leverage effect is not driven by the change in net debt, but by the change in equity ratio. So you create value through the leverage effect if equity as a share of the company's capital structure increases. Now these two value drivers, the unlevered return and the leverage effect, they combine to form the isomeric return. This is basically the hypothetical dilution neutral return or what would have happened if the GP share of company equity did not change over the holding period. And it is the mirror image of fund ownership impact, which is the influence of dilution or concentration on the GP's return. This word isomeric, it's from the Greek, and it roughly means equal shares. It's in the spirit of scientific terms like isomer, isotherm, and isobar that you might find in chemistry and physics. Okay, so these are the basic formulas. Let's see them in action. Generally, you want to line up your value creation inputs in a table like this one. Here we have a company that grows its enterprise valuation from 100 to 180. It pays down debt from 20 to zero, so its total shareholder equity grows from 80 to 180. During that time, the GP's equity grows from 44 to 88, generating a 2x gross multiple of invested capital. And the company's EBITDA grows from 20 to 30 over the hold. These numbers give us the T1 and T2 equity ratio, phi, and valuation multiples that you see in the table. The next step is to calculate all the deltas and averages because that's what drives the derivative model of value creation. We show these values here. We see that EBITDA grows by 10 million, which we expect to be a positive driver of value, and that's what happens here with 25.7 million of value creation. The 1x increase in valuation multiple has the same function. It leads to 11.7 million of additional value. The equity ratio increase of 20% provides 14.5 million of value creation. And finally, the decrease in GP ownership percentage gives us a negative delta phi, and this provides a fund ownership impact of negative 7.9 million. And when you add these four value drivers up, you get value creation of 44, which is exactly the change in fund level equity value you see in the table above. Here's the value bridge in graphical form, and you can find the Excel model for this on the website. Let's compare these numbers to what would have been generated from the conventional model of value creation that we described in VC102. In the derivative model, EBITDA growth and multiple expansion have this extra term for the average equity ratio. Since it's equal to 90% for this deal, the derivative model value drivers are 10% lower than what they would have been in the conventional model. Further, the derivative model's leverage effect is 4.1 million higher than the conventional model's cash flow generation of 10.4. This is because the leverage effect includes both cash flow generation and gearing, the ability of debt to amplify equity gains and losses. We will see precisely how we split the leverage effect into cash flow generation and gearing in a later video. One more thing worth noting here is how the derivative model's EBITDA growth and multiple expansion formulas compare to the Munich model of value creation described in VC103. We see here that they're almost identical, but we replace lambda with the average holding period equity ratio. This is significant because that lambda term can be quite complicated. It required inputs like interest rates and tax rates that you might not have access to, and it could also be quite volatile in scenarios where there's high leverage or large changes in net debt. The average equity ratio does not have the volatility problem and it's much easier to calculate, which makes it a much better option. So these are the fundamentals of the derivative model of value creation. In the next video, we will introduce the logarithmic model of value creation. It's quite interesting because the logarithmic model starts with a different set of assumptions and its equations look really different from the derivative model. But as we shall see, the results from both models are almost identical, usually within a few tenths of a percent.
Thanks for watching. If you're into this sort of thing, subscribe and check out the website Auxilia Mathematica. Registration is free and allows you to download Microsoft Excel files with all the data and charts used in these and other videos. On the site, you'll also find other resources like articles, templates, and a private forum for Q&A. When you visit, check out the site's free online value creation calculators. These web pages allow you to select various analysis parameters, plug in your own capital structure, P&L, and market data, and then measure value creation with a click of a button. I don't think that these calculators will replace your Excel models, but they're really useful for both preliminary investigations and double checking that your own spreadsheets are generating the right numbers. I should mention that if you're looking for a convenient reference and training tool with a form factor of a college text, make sure to check out my book, Private Equity Value Creation Analysis on Amazon.com. And finally, if you'd like to get up to speed with models like this more quickly than the book or the website allow, get in touch. Over the last 15 years, I've helped dozens of GPs build models like this for various fundraising and investor relations projects. Thanks for watching and see you next time.